welcome to our Bible study on the nines, Thursday night, having a Bible study in the church stairwell. That's right. Good camera angle as far as uh, lighting's concerned uh, for this particular time of day. I'm pre-recording this, so by the time you see this, it's pretty much dark, but uh, Bible study in the stairwell. And I want to thank you so much for tuning in. And I hope these uh, series of Bible studies have been a blessing to you. And I hope you've been having a good week. And so let's pick up where we left off uh, Tuesday night here in Mark chapter 14, verse 66 through 72. As we uh, looked at Peter and we looked at a rooster crow. And the first time he uh, crowed was a warning to Peter. The second time it was a reminder to Peter the words of Jesus. Then he recollected uh, what went through his mind. Tuesday night, I said that this week of Bible studies was dedicated to our graduates, those who are graduating from high school and graduating from college. Uh, but it, it has implications for each and every one of us in any area of our lives. And the truth and reality of life, though we try to deny it, though our society labels failures and losers, that we got to lose at times. We make mistakes at times. If we're going to learn anything in life, we have to lose a little bit. I never forget, I was on a basketball team one, uh, one fall, and we had an incredible run going, I think the 15-0, and 0, something like that. Uh, we got a little bit, you know, when, when you're going undefeated like that, you, you fail to realize some of your mistakes, and you play a team that you, you take a little too lightly that beats you, and it, it completely kills that undefeated record, but you learn from that loss of what you were doing wrong so you can make adjustments and keep winning. Uh, that To me, that's what losing, that's what mistakes happen in our life to do is to show us where we need to grow, where we need to adjust things, where we need to, you know, learn more. So no matter who we are, what stage of life we're in, what season of life we're in, we're still going to fail at times. We're still going to make mistakes at times. It's what we do with those failures that mold us and make us and shape us into the people that God wants us to be. But we've got to decide rather to overcome the failure rather than allow the failure to overcome you. That's the choice. I say all the time, it's not a failure if you learn from it. So centering with Simon Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, he was a man for three years, walked with the Lord, talked to the Lord, learned from the Lord. And at the night before his crucifixion, failed the test shortly before graduation. But I wonder when Peter wept. So let me, let me read the text, our, our centering text here uh, in, in chapter 14, verse 66. Now as Peter uh, was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are saying. And he went out on the porch and a rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, this is one of them. But he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, surely you are one of them for you are a Galilean and your speech shows it. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. A second time the rooster crowed. Then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus has said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And when he thought about it, and note that when he thought about it, he wept. I wonder what Peter was thinking about when he was weeping. The words of Jesus, the, his failure to deny Jesus, a failure to defend Jesus and deny him. I, I want to think what went through his mind was the last three years of spending time with Jesus and all the lessons he learned and all the failures to that point. I want to think that Peter was evaluating his life in light of Christ and embarrassed that he denied him to see just exactly why he wound up denying him when he promised he wouldn't. You see, my friend, that's what failures are designed to do. See, we're not perfect. I mentioned this Tuesday night. We're not perfect. 
Bad things happen to us inadvertently. Bad things can happen to us circumstantially. But sometimes we bring things on ourselves. We make mistakes. We fail. But understand it's not a failure if you learn from it. Failures are designed to embarrass us, get our attention, help us evaluate our lives in light of the truth of the word of God, to see where we fall short, where we mess up, how we can correct them and move forward for Christ. I believe in my heart as Peter's weeping, he's, he's repenting here. We're going to pick up on that just a little bit. But I, I see this. I really believe this because Peter made an adjustment. And we see the results of Peter's life after this turning point in the New Testament. He became a wonderful apostle for the Lord. The first 12 chapters of Acts preached. Thousands were saved. He um, wrote two books of the New Testament. And even Mark's gospel Mark was beside, John Mark was beside Peter. And this is really Peter's account from Mark's perspective as he's writing this gospel. You know what? Failure, if we embrace it, if we learn from it, is a teaching tool to help us grow in our faith. So here's the question I want to bring out to you in this chapter. Why do we fail in life? And what is the solution to when we fail in life? That's what I want to pick up on based on the, the, the uh, introduction that I gave you on Tuesday night. So why do we fail in life? Let's tackle this first question. You know what? Looking at Peter's path in Mark chapter 14, leading up to his denial of Jesus, I see five problems. Five. There we go. Five problems. Five problems evident in his life that ultimately led to his failure of denying Jesus the night before his crucifixion. When thinking about every failure we've experienced, I can almost guarantee that the same five problems have surfaced. Five problems can cause us to fail life's test at times. I'm guilty of these five things. If we examine your heart, I'm sure you're guilty of these five things. So we're going to look at these five things as a warning to us and a reminder to us. And then we're going to look at the solution tonight in our Bible study. So let's dig into the word here in chapter 14. Look at verse 27 through verse 31. Let's backtrack. You know how you see those movies or those clips that something happens and you're going, what's going on? And it re re rewinds the tape to see the path that led to that. Well, we're going to rewind the tape. We just read to you the denial. Let's rewind the tape a little bit to see Peter's path up to this denial. Number one, why do we fail in life? Because we talk more than we listen. We talk more than we listen. Hey, let's look at verse 27. They're going to the garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised I will go before you into Galilee. Peter said to him, even if all were made to stumble, yet I will not be. Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he spoke more vehemently. If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said likewise. So what's going on here? Peter's talking more than he should be listening to the Lord. After the Last Supper and after they had sung a hymn, the Hallel, uh, Psalm 115 through Psalm 118 is the Hallel. They would sing this at Passover. I believe that after the Last Supper, it's Thursday night. If you look at the Passover timeline, they're heading across Jerusalem to the temple where they finish with the 118th Psalm. They go through the Eastern Gate, down the Kidron Valley, to the foot of the Mount of Olives, there at the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is lovingly warning his disciples. This is kind of taking place at the same time as there in John, uh, the, 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 where he's instructing the church about the Holy Spirit and things. Uh, there in John 14, John 15, John 16. And, but Jesus says, all of you will be offended because of me this night. Offend means to stumble because of misunderstanding. Jesus knew that they would stumble over their misunderstanding of his seeming defeat and death. 
Prior to this night, it was Jesus' enemies who had been offended by his teaching. Now it was his closest disciples who would be offended and fail him. You see a sheep panic over the death of the shepherd. So the disciples would desert Jesus and scatter during his passion and his death. Because Jesus is quoting here in this passage, Zechariah chapter 13 and in verse 7. But after this prophecy he gives, he assures them that their scattering would only be for a short time. Because Jesus would be resurrected and he would precede them into Galilee. He says, go before, I will go before you. That's the act of the shepherd. The, she the shepherd goes before the sheep and the sheep would again be gathered by their shepherd in Galilee. There was the promise. The response by the disciples was not joy. The response from the disciples was disturbed by the possibility that they would fail the master they loved and learned from these three years. This was the third time Jesus had mentioned this to his disciples. At the first time at Caesarea Philippi, Peter rebuked him. The second time he mentioned it was on the way to Jerusalem before, uh, before Palm Sunday when he was met with the ambitious uh, mother of James and John. The third time was met with the arrogance here of Peter, making himself the exception by saying, oh, they, the, the other disciples might be offended, but not me. Admonish or rebuke, ambition and arrogance. The results of talking more than listening. The result of thinking that you know it all so that you do not listen. There is evidence of overconfidence, and arrogance. Peter's bold, arrogant, overconfident statement was a result of talking more than listening, which ultimately would factor into his failure. How many times in life have we had an exaggerated view of ourselves or, or our own importance or our own abilities? Maybe it's enhanced by social media to the extent we think we're somebody. In reality, we're not. How many times in life have We've been warned of a potential failure when we, know, when we think we know it all, we don't listen. How many times have we failed on the job or in a marriage or in a relationship or in anything because we failed to listen to counsel, whether it was a trusted friend, a trusted pastor, a trusted counselor, a trusted parent, a teacher, or a mentor? You see, we have a society that places more value on youth than they do age and experience. And that hurts our society so much. I really do believe this because we think that older people aren't up on the times and they have nothing to offer to society. And that, my friend, is so not true. That is so not true. Uh, and graduates, if you're, if you're watching this, you're graduating. Maybe it's high school or college. Hey, man, congratulations on your college degree. You have a lot of information. You have a lot of knowledge. Now you have to live life. And listen to those who've gone before you who have made some mistakes and taken that advice. And we make, we make mistakes and we think, here, let me, give, let me give you an example. All right. My pawpaw style of pastoring and my style of pastoring, day and night difference, we're two different people. All right. See, I, I'll give you an example. I use a computer. I'm doing videos with social media uh, with, with what I'm doing as a pastor. My pawpaw would have never done that. I used a computer to type my messages. He used a typewriter built in the 1960s. Completely okay, both ways. We, have two, two, we had two different styles. I was a 1990s teen. He was a 1940s teen. All right, we were two different people, two different styles of pastor. But you know what? We had one thing in common. We had the Lord. We still pastored people. Times had changed, but people had not changed. The situations had not changed. So I still listened to him and got counsel from him on up to the day he died because he still knew more about pastoring and life than I did. I'll give you an example. When King Rehoboam in the Bible listened to the advice of the younger people and ignored the advice of the elders, his kingdom became a mess. Now we have a choice whether or not to follow advice. You know, we ask for advice, people give us advice. We have a choice whether or not to follow that advice or not, but it does us all good to listen to those experienced in the same field that we are. So many times we talk more than we listen and it can get us into trouble. And I see here, it, would, it was going to get Peter into trouble. I spent so much time on this first point. Let me get to the second one. Why do we fail in life? Not only talking more than listening, but sleeping more than praying. 
Verse number 37 through 41. He came and found them sleeping. They're in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says to Peter, Peter, why are you sleeping? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. And you look in verse 39, 40, and 41. He, he comes the third time and he, and he says to them, are, are you still sleeping and resting? It's enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. So, sleeping more than praying. Now, as Jesus goes into the garden, he tells Peter, James, and John to watch and pray lest you enter into temptation because the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. That's a good, that's good advice right there in anything in life. Our flesh is weak and the spirit of God's willing. He found Peter sleeping when he should have been watching and praying. What's going on? This is um, Lil Shemarim. This is the night of watching. Moses had commanded this in Exodus on Passover night after they sung the Hallel they went to the garden. They would stay up all night and watch. It was, it was a tradition. But their eyes were heavy. We've experienced that at times in our own lives. And his words, I really do believe the best interpretation of Jesus' words here were a question. Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It kind of fits the context here. And then he says it is enough. He informs them that their sleep was over for the night. He told them that the hour was come, the hour in which he came into the world. So with this in mind, here is Jesus, the Son of God, fully human and fully God at his darkest hour, and his disciples were sleeping instead of watching and praying. How many times in our life, symbolically speaking, have we been asleep at the will rather than watching and praying? We lack power in our churches today. We lack success in our churches today because we fail to watch be on guard and pray the church has become a good place to sleep rather than a place to play pray how can jesus disciples make any impact in this world when they're sleeping rather than praying peter failed that night symbolically because he was sleeping rather than praying i'm not saying sleeping's wrong there's a time to sleep and there's a time to pray we like power and clarity in life because we like prayer let me ask you a question. Do you pray in life before you make decisions, big decisions, before you eat your meals, when you get up, when you go to bed? Do you pray without ceasing? Do you watch in life for anything that could derail you or have you been rocked to sleep by the culture and all of its messages? So many times we sleep more than we should be watching and praying and that can get us into trouble. I see Peter on this slippery slope. Number three, talking before listening, sleeping rather than praying. Number three, acting before thinking. Look at verse 47. One of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. A good, a good definition of impulsiveness. I'm guilty of this in my life. I'm sure you may be as well. Acting before you think. That's what impulsiveness is, acting before you think. When you act before you think in life, you will get in trouble. It, will, it can lead to failure. According to this verse in John 18, 10, Peter acted before he thought. Jesus had told his disciples to arm themselves, and they had shown him two swords in Luke 22, 36 through 38. Jesus did not intend that they should be used to protect him. Peter, who was acting out of impulsiveness, swung at one of Jesus' assailants who was there to arrest him, the servant of the high priest, probably intending to sever his head. It may be this man ducked. At any rate, the sword cut only the man's ear off. The incident has relevance to Peter's fear a few hours later when he was recognized as a relative, by a relative of the wounded man. John records his name as Malchus, John 18.10. And Luke records in Luke twenty two fifty one 51 that Jesus healed Malchus's ear. Nevertheless, Peter's impulsiveness, and you see impulsive Peter throughout the early part of his, his life. It was part of his failure. And he, he, I think as an older man, right in first and second Peter, he's reflecting upon that. But in our lives, how many times do we act before we think? Maybe something happens on the job and we quit because we don't like it. We quit out of anger. Well, you don't have another job lined up and the bills are coming. 
or we say something we don't mean out of frustration and anger and it comes back to bite us in, in our relationships with people. In order to live life successfully, we must all learn as we go about life to think before we act, think before we speak. If not, others get hurt and we will be hurt. Number four, following more than leading. Look at verse 54. But Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. So Jesus' command to his disciples in Matthew 26, 31, was that they were to scatter and wait. Peter followed afar off, even to the palace of the high priest, where Jesus was being tried early that morning. He sits down with the servants and warms himself at the fire. What's going on? It springs a little chilly. Jerusalem's about 2,500 foot elevation. So Peter's following Jesus as what he considers to be a safe distance yet close enough to have a little bit of information what's going on. Yet he was disobeying the Lord who had commanded him to run away. Allow this event in history to happen. Peter, who was to run and hide instead of sat with the crowd, the priestly servants at the fire pretended he's one of them. I see Peter trying to straddle the fence here a little bit. Following Jesus to the extent he knew what was going on while also pretending that he was not a disciple, just part of the crowd, maybe out of fear. That is following more than leading. That is caring what other people think than what the Lord thinks. This idea has caused failure more times than not in life. You see, when we try to follow the crowd and be like the crowd, or even straddle the fence, we start to become more like they want us to be like, and we cannot be ourselves. Peter would deny Christ and fail because he's following the crowd caring what they thought about him, not wanting to associate himself with Jesus, self-preservation and survival. Number five, flesh fulfilled rather than spirit filled. Look at verse 71. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. Look where this path led him. While Jesus was on trial inside, Peter was on trial outside. Jesus didn't fail and has never failed because he's God. Peter's self-confidence was no match for the terror of that night. As we've already looked in the text, the first one to recognize Peter was a maid who allowed him to come in, a very observant person. As she observed Peter studying his features, she did not ask, but rather stated she recognized him as being one of his disciples. And Peter, in that moment, forgot. In, in the midst of temptation, it's not that we when we give in to that temptation, it's not that we don't love the Lord. We forget about him and we forget about his word. Peter denies his Lord. Then the second time she was moving about doing duties and the curiosity with others standing around, you know, accused Peter again of being one of his disciples. And, and then the third time his speech betrays him and the crowd notices that. And then he's, uh, he's calling out curses and using profanity. And in that rooster crow the second time, how many times in our lives do we fail to pray? We're arrogant. We're overconfident. We let our guard down. We act before we think. We follow what everybody else thinks to the extent we're insecure and frightened. And what, and what is in our heart in that moment comes out on our lips. We deny Jesus by our actions sometimes to the extent we curse. What has happened? We've given into our flesh instead of the Holy Spirit. Talking more than listening sleeping more than praying, acting before thinking, following more than leading, flesh fulfilled rather than spirit filled. These things in your life I mean, can be problems that will lead to failure. They were evident in Peter's life on the night that Jesus was arrested in the garden and they can be evident in our heart today. So what's the solution? Let's, let's look at the takeaway now, the application. Four solutions that you can do when you fail in life's test. Here's the first solution. See your failure. See your failure. So many people, when they fail, they fail to see the underlying problem. They're blinded by pride. They're, they repeat the same thing and they experience the same result. You know what insanity is? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. 
You must see your failure. You must choose to see your failure. I cannot see your failure for you. Others cannot see your failure for you. I can only guide you and preach the word. Others can help to an extent. You see, on an individual life, God must open our eyes as he did Peter through this humiliating experience that you see, in fact, what the underlying problem is. We must see the failure. The second solution. After we see it, we need to repent of your failure. After you see it, you repent, pleading the blood of Christ over that failure. So many, see, so many people see their failure but don't do anything about it. They just make an excuse of why they are that way or they blame somebody else. Stop the blaming. Stop the excuses. See yourself coming short of the glory of God. Turn to Christ. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. And if you know him as, Christ, uh, know him as Savior, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So after we see it and repent of it, third solution, learn from your failure. After you see it, repent it, examine it in the light of the word of God so that you can learn the proper lessons in order to live life in victory and even help somebody else struggling with the same failure. That's the purpose of the body of Christ, the church. Then we move on from the failure. After you see it, repent it, learn from it. You must, you must, you must, you must move on from it. If not, you're going to be haunted by guilt. Learn to forgive yourself. Has Christ forgiven your sins? Have you pleaded the blood of Christ over your sins? Then forgive yourself and move on. In closing, let's note the rooster again that crowed. My folk, I've been fascinated by the rooster looking at this text. I mentioned the rooster on Tuesday night and the reminder and the warning and the recollection, but I thought about this as I was meditating on this passage the other night. The rooster crowing carried with it a promise. When I was a little boy, I mentioned this Tuesday night, we owned four hens and a rooster. And I, I mentioned earlier that, that that rooster was the meanest chicken we ever had. Anyway, that rooster would crow at the same time each morning, sunrise. And I'm reminded that when the rooster crows, it's a new day. It's sunrise. There's a promise of a new day. Uh, this particular day, of course, in Peter's situation, was the darkest day of history. The day that Christ went to the cross for our sins. But it had to happen to bring about our redemption. The psalmist says, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The psalmist is referring to the day, the day of crucifixion. We will rejoice in that day. And for 2,000 years, we have been rejoicing in that day. When the rooster crowed, there was a promise that through the death of Christ and his atoning sacrifice for our sin, we can turn our mistakes and our failures into triumphs and victories. What grace, what forgiveness, what mercy. Lamentations chapter 3, 22 and 23, it is of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. If you're here and you're watching and you fail the Lord, remember this, the promise of the rooster crowing. Hey, that rooster crowed as a warning. That, that rooster crowed as a reminder and, and you're recoll recollecting. But what happens? That rooster is a promise of a new day, a new chance to make it right with the Savior. Would you do that? Would you do that? Maybe I'm talking to somebody. You've made mistakes in life. I don't know who I'm talking to. I don't know who's watching. That's the, that's the weirdest part about talking to a screen. You know, you can see me, but I can't see you. So I don't know who I'm talking to. But if you're watching and you've made mistakes and there's failures, understand you're not, you're not past the mercy and grace of Christ. He died for you. There's the rooster crow and there's the promise of a new day. See the failure, repent of it, learn from it, move on from it in, with, with victory in Christ. That's for those who don't know him. But if you know him as Savior, you backslid a little bit. Hey, there's a promise of a new day. That's why I'm so thankful for the blood. That's why I'm so thankful for, for Christ. And that rooster shows that to me. Well, my time's gone. And, uh, I hope you enjoyed this Bible study. And uh, I hope you have a good weekend. And looking forward to Sunday, the Lord's Day coming up. And I hope you have a good evening. 
and God bless you.